Welcome back friends. Welcome to another video tutorial from Shomu's biology. In the past few videos we've been talking about the glycogen metabolism, especially the two parts of glycogen metabolism. One is the glycogen synthesis from glucose known as glycogenesis. Another one is the glycogen breakdown to produce glucose known as glycogenolysis. We have talked about those two steps and we've also talked about the mechanism and in our body how exactly these two steps are regulated with the help of the secretion of hormone insulin and glucagon that helps to regulate the blood glucose level and we also talked about the two types of energy state in our body that is high energy state and low energetic state now again in this video lecture I am going to talk about another situation in our body known as gluconeogenesis or it's also known as neoglucogenesis same thing what is this neoglucogenesis now if you look at this name it's known as gluconeogenesis so gluco means is for glucose genesis means the production so in this case we are looking at production or generation of glucose molecules now from what normally what we saw here there are two energetic state when our body is undergoing a high energetic state that means we have an ample amount of glucose molecules and we have excess amount of glucose molecules so what we did here we store some of these glucose molecules as glycogen in the liver or in the muscle cells now later when we require blood glucose we don't when we don't have a glucose level and the blood glucose level going down that is a signal that our body receives so this is a monitor system in the blood this percentage of glucose should be present if it goes down that's an alarm if it goes up that's also an alarm for different hormones to be secreted once the blood glucose level goes down that means we don't have ample amount of glucose so we won't be able to produce ample amount of energy to support our body's need in those situations that is a part of low energy state what we need to do we need to produce glucose and we need to produce the glucose and provide it to the blood so that the blood glucose level goes to the balance and the body's homeostasis is maintained properly and in those situations what we do there are one way there is one way the first way is a breakdown of glycogen so glycogen can be broken down into glucose molecules it can be it's very simple utilizing different glycogen breakdown enzymes the process is known as glycogenolysis that can generate glucose intermediates which can be utilized directly in the process of glycolysis because although this process generates glucose one phosphate but not exactly the glucose molecules so in this case it will be really difficult to produce glucose molecules through that glycogenolysis pathway so there got to be some way to solve that and the way is gluconeogenesis in this case we are producing exact glucose molecules from what the answer is from a very common intermediate pyruvate so here we are producing glucose from pyruvate now if you remember correctly we normally produce pyruvate from glucose in one of the very most common and very important step of cellular respiration that is glycolysis in the glycolysis pathway we are going from glucose to pyruvate and in this process we also generate two molecules of ATP but in this case of gluconeogenesis or neoglucogenesis we want to produce glucose from pyruvate that is gluconeo genesis so here we are reversing the glycolysis pathway and we know we have several intermediate during the glycolysis pathway which are highly energetic molecules and reversing those pathways will be really difficult and energy consuming now if i give a simple example you know the glycolysis yields us two atp molecules but for conversion of two pyruvates to a intermediate that is 2 1 3 bis phosphoglycerate if we go from 2 pyruvates to 2 1 3 bis phosphoglycerate because later on it will be converted to glucose just to go from 2 pyruvates to 2 1 3 bis phosphoglycerate we need 6 molecules of ATP invested at that point 
So it's, a, it's almost three times of energy cost that you have to pay to produce glucose from pyruvate. Now this is a dangerous situation because if you think yourself this is a low energetic state itself you don't have much energy to to your hand to your body but still you need to invest energy to produce glucose so why body should do that the answer is you need to keep the blood glucose level in balance not more than that not less than that so here once the glucose is glucose should be produced if it's required to get in the blood and that is the only way to go from pyruvate to glucose because if you think of lipid metabolism because you know lipid carries a large amount of energy in them so why not breaking down lipid why not going to form glucose from lipid well lipid breakdowns ultimately ends with acetyl coa molecule now acetyl coa molecules cannot be directly converted to glucose in animal cells it's not possible in animals in case of us it's not a possibility but though acetyl coa is present acetyl coa is already present even after different lipid breakdowns but we cannot go directly by this process it's not possible so what we can do is even though we have acetyl coa right after the beginning right, right at the beginning of tca cycle and stuff it can't be done so the only way to produce glucose here should be gluconeogenesis which will save us at a specific point of our life of our cellular respiration pathway now when again we get the energy sources we replenish that now it's not necessarily that the process of neoglucogenesis always work in the low energy state it's not the thing the idea of low energy and high energy state is for glycogen breakdown and glycogen synthesis the the neoglucogenesis is linked with the blood glucose level concentration try to relate that so whenever the blood glucose level goes down glucagon will signal the process of neoglucogenesis and also they try to generate the glucose by breaking down glycogen that's also a possibility but that is the actual idea that we need to go for gluconeogenesis another important thing about gluconeogenesis is the where does it occur it occurs mostly in the liver okay and very less amount in the cortex of our kidneys there is no gluconeogenesis in our muscle so what happens in, in this case once it produces the glucose in the liver it stores them and it usually occurs at the low energy state that is if you are in the low carbohydrate diet or if you are under extensive exercise. So it's kind of linked with the idea of ketosis or generation of ketone bodies because you know the idea is our brain cells they, they only rely on glucose as a food source. So if there is no glucose our brain cells will not survive so specific type of cells in our body must have glucose to function this is another reason you need to even invest energy to produce glucose because it's very special except for glucose our brain also receives ketone bodies as a source of energy so in those highly intense exercise conditions or very low carbohydrate diet that we usually do for burning fat very rapidly and make a lean mass that's what you see in the bodybuilding and gym and all this stuff this is what happens you need to go through a ketosis and ketogenic diet which will be low on carbohydrate and much fast and high on other things that will only fresh from this cellular metabolism of carbohydrate shift it towards the ketogenesis okay so that is a little overview about gluconeogenesis now about the steps of gluconeogenesis Follow the second part of this video which is a beautiful animation to explain the steps of gluconeogenesis and it will be pretty much similar with the glycolysis steps but few differences in few single unidirectional processes uh, with the enzyme changes. Most of the enzymes will be similar although. So stay tuned. Okay, so let's now talk about uh, the different stages of gluconeogenesis. As I told you that uh, the pathway of gluconeogenesis and glycolysis are very very similar. In fact uh, all these 10 stages of glycolysis almost 7 stages are same with gluconeogenesis. As in this case we are going backwards. In glycolysis we are going from glucose to pyruvate while in this case we are going from pyruvate towards glucose. So if you look at here at the end this is the pyruvate the end uh, molecule of uh, glycolysis. 
and we are going to produce glucose from there. So if you look at here the glycolysis and gluconeogenesis stages side by side, you will see most of the steps are in control with same in line going forward as well as backwards. For example, 2 phosphoglycerate to phosphoenol pyruvate by the enzyme enolase. And similarly, from phosphoenol pyruvate to 2 phosphoglycerate is also catalyzed by the enzyme enolase. Similarly, for all these blue colored written enzymes that are involved in this process. But the difference between gluconeogenesis and the process of glycolysis varies in three separate stages. First stage, second, uh, first, third, and the last reactions of glycolysis is the altered region, uh, the difference between glycolysis and gluconeogenesis. So let's look at it. Glucose can be synthesized from this non-carbohydrate precursor in this process. It occurs when the body has exhausted the supply of glucose and glycogen. Many steps are similar as I told you. If you look at this reversal pathway, starting from the pyruvate, the first step backwards to produce phosphoenol pyruvate would be highly endergonic because it's a hugely energy required process through this glycolytic. Normally through the glycolytic pathway from phosphoenol pyruvate to uh, pyruvate, it is a, a process that derives some energy, it produces some energy. But while going backward, it will be really, really difficult and it will it will gain a, it will require a lot of energy to going backward in gluconeogenesis two different enzymes thus are required to produce this phosphoenol pyruvate from pyruvate the first is called as pyruvate carboxylase and the second enzyme is known as phosphoenol pyruvate carboxykinase or pepsi k in this case it decarboxylates oxaloacetate and phosphorylates the intermediate to produce phosphoenol pyruvate the overall free energy change of this conversion of pyruvate to phosphenol pyruvate by the pyruvate carboxylase and Pepsi K is minus 22.6 kilojoules per mole. Here you can see uh, the idea. So here, from here you can get an idea about to convert pyruvate into phosphenol pyruvate. We need to provide a lot of ATP or ATP equivalent as an energy source. So for the first step or process of converting pyruvate into oxaloacetate with pyruvate carboxylase we need to use ATP and derive energy from ATP hydrolysis while from oxaloacetate to phosphenol pyruvate with the help of Pepsi K we need the presence of GTP uh, as a process the phosphenol pyruvate to fructose 1,6 bisphosphate in the glycolytic enzymes operate near equilibrium for all the stages that means if the concentration of phosphenol pyruvate increases, the reaction will be driven to the reverse of the glycolysis and that is the rate determining step. To produce fructose 1,6 bisphosphate, the six enzymes shown here participate in both glycolysis which is in forward direction and uh, in this case gluconeogenesis. Both of them uh, will involve with the same number of enzymes, same enzymes and similar pathways. The final step in gluconeogenesis involved in one isomerization and two dephosphorylation. So the isomerization step is catalyzed by glycolytic enzyme, but the other two steps use different enzymes in glycolysis. Phosphorylation of the sugar is achieved by simply providing a phosphate group from ATP and it converts fructose 6-phosphate to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. But in this case, to go backwards for this process is not that easy because it will be like difficult in this case because normally going forward it will give the yield of 24.5 kilojoules per mole but going backwards will be minus 8.6 kilojoules per mole. So here this reaction as we see it's exergonic earlier. So the reversal would also be as you see the reversal of that 24.5 to 32.9 kilojoules per mole depending upon the step. So in gluconeogenesis, two different phosphatases catalyze the exergonic dephosphorylation steps and releasing inorganic phosphate. The first enzyme is fructose bisphosphatase and the free energy change is minus 8.6. So here you see fructose bisphosphatase enzyme will take out one of the phosphate group, one of the inorganic phosphate group out of the fructose 1,6 bisphosphate and convert it into fructose 6 phosphate. 
The next step is isomerization of fructose 6-phosphate into glucose. Fructose 6-phosphate into glucose 6-phosphate and that's also mediated by phosphoglucose isomerase, the same enzyme involved in the process of converting glucose 6-phosphate into fructose 6-phosphate during glycolysis. Now the last step is another very similar step like the one just we saw earlier. In this case, the conversion of glucose 6-phosphate to glucose requires another phosphatase enzyme, another phosphatase that is found only in liver and kidney. The free energy change in this case will be minus 5.1 kilojoules per mole. Now this is another reaction where we don't need any ATP because we have a positive value of uh, the del G so it will go forward this reaction, a uh, negative value of del G so it will go forward. So if you like this video please hit the like button, subscribe to my channel to make it grow and also make more and more videos like this for you. And also share this video with every friend and also in every social networking sites. Thank you.